And like she said, uh, we do have a lot of content to cover today, so I'll try to be as fast as I can. But um, thank and as she introduced me, my name is Cole Finney. Uh, I'm the product manager for the Bullhorn remote monitors, the Triton test stations, and the Micromax portable current interrupters. Um, so just taking a look at our agenda here, um, we're going to be covering a whole bunch of different measurement factors that are tied into a measurement device you'll be using when taking your um, cathodic protection measurements. I have a whole bunch on the screen to the right there, looking at our uh, DBM, the Micromax, and a few other tools. We'll be covering um, as well as how these all these terms work together to calculate and get to what measurement you actually are receiving on your DBM. And then finally, a few best practices for actually um, taking those measurements and maintaining the device that you use to capture the measurements. So kind of the first one we're going to talk about today is, um, is range. So the, um, basically, range is the, the highest and lowest measurement that any measurement device can capture. So I have a few examples on the screen here. On the left is just a simple waveform. And that waveform has um, a signal and with a plus or minus 200 milliamps as the highest and lowest measurement that you could capture. So that would be your range. If you're looking at a spec sheet, so I have the specs on the screen for the RM510, our remote monitor for our rectifier unit, uh, for a rectifier, you'll see that that range can vary for DC and AC current. And oftentimes, you'll encounter various different types of ranges for whatever measurement tool you're using. Um, so like on a DVM, you'll probably encounter a plus or minus 250 volts or greater oftentimes. And on a rectifier monitor, all the way up to almost 300 volts. It's very common to encounter. Okay, so like I was saying, um, resolution is basically the smallest measurement that you can take on any measurement device. So that's usually what the smallest one it can represent. So as you can see on the screen, I've got two Mesa tablets, or if you use an Allegro field computer, you'll be able to see the same type of screen. But basically, these two devices are capturing the same measurement, but the uh, resolution is smaller on the one on the right, so you can capture a more granular uh, measurement on what you're measuring. So you have one volt on the right uh, left, and then a thousand millivolts on the right, but these are the same measurement. Um, so you want to make sure whenever you're out in the field capturing your compliance measurements, you want to have the resolution on your DVM set to the right resolution for what you're capturing. Oftentimes, a smaller measurement is better. And here is how um, this is. This will explain why. So this is more of a real world example when you're going out and uh, taking a compliance software measurement or a compliance measurement. So you might encounter if you if I'm out in the field, I walk up to a test post. My DVM is set up with a resolution of about 50 millivolts. So for me, I can only take a measurement in increments of 50 millivolts. So I will walk up to this test post. I hook my DVM up with my connectors, take my pipe to solar reading. I see the reading of negative 850, negative 850 volts. Looks good to me. I mark it as a pass. I move on. Well, however, the actual structure measure potential on that structure was negative 833 volts. So in reality, I actually gave myself a false pass because I thought I was capturing the right measurement based on the settings of my DVM, when in reality, I needed to have a smaller resolution to be able to capture a correct measurement. So if I had set my resolution to one millivolt instead of 50 millivolts, I'd come back to that exact same structure, take my pipe to solar reading and actually see a negative 834 volt measurement. So then I would actually know that that test post failed through a compliance check and I have to mitigate my CP system in some way. So this is really important to make sure whatever tool you're using, you're using the 2310 or the, um, the 2130 DVM, make sure it's all the resolution is set up correctly on your field computer. So the next one I'll talk about really quick, I'm firing through this, so sorry, uh, is um, the sensitivity. So sensitivity is the smallest signal that your, that your measurement device can, can detect all across its most sensitive range. So um, I have a picture on the screen. You're like, why is there a bug on the screen? Get it off. Re in reality, it's because um, I use this as an example. So the human hand can capture, uh, we have so many sensors and so many uh, ability to capture varying degrees of signals on our fingertips. Um, something as large as a cell phone all the way down to like a, a post-it note or a, piece of, or a piece of paper. But in reality, we can receive a signal as small as 40 micrometers, which is like a mosquito needle. So something along those, that is an example of kind of showing that we have a wide range of sensitivity. That um, Our sensitivity can be as small as in micrometers, 
but you'll be able to capture that in a wide range of settings. Um, here's another few examples of what, how this will, you might actually encounter this in the field. Um, so, if you, or when you're working with technology, especially. So, sensitivity is often interchanged with the word noise. You probably hear those two terms come up quite a bit. Um, but the main difference is noise is um, any random signal from another source that could affect the value of your measurement. If you have a spectrograph, you can see this really well. I don't have one in front of me. But um, so that's where you see on the top example, I have a source measure unit, which is basically a power supply. Um, it generates and then erect uh, an RM510 below that when the same spec is called noise for a power supply because it's generating power. And it's no, it's, when it's in measurement term, it's going to be called sensitivity. And you might see I have resolution and sensitivity highlighted. They're directly connected to each other. So the sensitivity of your device is often measured in the smallest resolution that your device can capture. So you'll see that on the 510 below, you have a sensitivity of about five microvolts, but the resolution is one microvolt. So you'll be able to capture measurements in increments of microvolts, but the lowest one you can actually probably capture will be about five microvolts. Um, so they work together in, in, your in your technology to be able to capture the right measurement and to be able to determine how sensitive of a measurement you can capture. So the next one we're going to talk about real quick is um, accuracy. This is a big one. Everyone talks about this one the most, probably. Um, accuracy is basically, it's the expected difference between a traceable standard and what your device's measurement is. So um, I have a few, um, and most of the time, these standards are set by a certain body. I have the NIST on the screen as an example. Oh, and then you can measure those with a calibration device or validation device. And this is really crucial for when you calibrate your DVMs. So this is another way to show it. Um, this is looking at a bow tie plot, which shows um, the actual um, calculation to if you wanted to calculate what accuracy is, which is really your percentage of offset plus the percentage of your gain. And you can see the x-axis as our traceable standard. The y-axis is your margin of error. And your red, your red arrows on the top and bottom are the accuracy spec bounds. So if you have a device that's within the accuracy spec bounds, you'll probably see a measurement look like this across the entire range of that, of that device's measurement range. So you'll see that that device is within calibration, and it's within, it's, it's within the acceptable standard for the measurements that you're trying to take. But you'll, this is just important to know about because every year, when we recommend people calibrating their device every year because anytime you're in the field taking measurements and something like an audit comes up, oftentimes validation paperwork is going to be asked for for the device that was used to capture a DVM. I've seen it happen with digital voltmeters. I've potentially heard about it happening with an RMU. Um, so it's very important to be aware of this and how it all relates to making sure you're taking an accurate measurement. So this comes up a lot as well with accuracy. We've always heard about this um, accuracy versus repeatability. So repeatability is an, another word for it that probably we hear more is precision. Um, so basically, precision or repeatability is the variation of one successive measurement to the next one. So I have a few examples on the screen here of how this is usually encountered in the, in the real world. Um, so on the left, you have a, a precise measurement, but it's not accurate. So why would it be accurate in this case? It would not be accurate because that um, red diamond is considered our accuracy spec. If you refer to the bow tie plot we looked at on the last slide, um, and you're able, to, this person was able to repeat that measurement three times in the same uh, within the same specs of okay, this uh, this me pardon me, this reading is repeatable, but it's not within the accuracy specs that are set or what they wanted to capture. So in this case, this is a really good example of what a non a DVM that's out of calibration would look like. You're probably going to be able to get the same readings over and over again, but it's not within the accuracy specs of the device. So you're going to have to go get it calibrated. And then in the middle, you'll encounter something where you have an accurate reading, where it's within the accuracy spec bounds. You kind of know what you're looking for, but you can't repeat the measurement. So then you're aware of like, oh, well, like, is there, oh, do I have interference? Is there some noise coming out of that rectifier that I need to mitigate? Or do I have stray current? And what's going on here that I can't repeat my, my measurement? Then end goal, what you come out of this is you come out with, you want to have an accurate and a repeatable measurement. 
So you know, the last picture there is, is all of those measurements. You're able to repeat the same one over and over again or within a certain margin of error. And then you're able all within the accuracy spec bounds of your device and what you're looking for. So in the end goal, that's what you want to look at whenever you have, you're looking for an accurate um, and repeatable measurement. So this is a ne this next one is very, very important. So input impedance and input resistance. Um, really what the, these two words, they're different in the scientific world, but for us today, they're going to be probably used pretty interchangeably, um, especially in the CP world. But basically it's um, input impedance and input resi resistance are each a measurement of opposition of current flow through a conductor. So basically the, the um, it's really important to know that you want to have an input impedance that's higher than any source impedance you may get, such as soil resistivity, to make sure that whatever load you're, cap you're measuring um, in your circuit, it, you minimize the amount of margin of error you're going to see. Here's a better way to, to show this as outside of just a definition on the screen. So this is a formula that you can use to kind of capture your, your actual meters, the meter voltage you're capturing against the true potential. So the, the, a lot of the factors that go into this are your, uh, your true, the actual potential on your structure and then input impedance and circuit resistance. Um, so when you put these all together, you'll see that depending on what your input impedance is, it'll affect the margin of error that you're gonna be able to see on your digital voltmeter. So I have three examples on the screen, um, one with one mega ohm input impedance, one with 10 mega ohm input impedance, and 100 mega ohms of input impedance. Basically, this highlights that, and we have one circuit across the board with a negative 900 millivolt uh, true potential. So we all know this, we're coming into this expecting a negative 900 millivolt true potential. If you take that same reading with a device with one mega ohms of input impedance, you'll go through the calculations and we're assuming everything else is constant. You're going to get upwards of over 9% margin of error on that reading. So you're going to be, there's a pretty large uh, spec difference than you might be anticipating whenever you go out and take a measurement versus if you go with the 10 mega ohms, it's about 1% margin of error. And then up to 100 mega ohms, you get down to 0.1% margin of error. So, I mean, that way, if you know that you have a really high input impedance on your device, which the DVM2130 does have a 100 mega ohm input impedance, you know that the percentage of error that you're going to be, you're probably going to have a very small percentage of error unless you're in an area with a really high um, source impedance. And then there are standards out there as well from AMP and other bodies that recommend something higher than 10 mega ohms, but that's why we, around, we shoot for 100 mega ohms or greater as a good recommendation. Hey, Cole, we got a question in the chat from Casey okay. Wheeler. He says, when taking waveforms with the FDC device and it's set to auto range, why does it change from 250V and 5 volts? And then it ends up giving sections of invalid data within the waveform. Zero reads for a short section. Um, you know, that's a really good question, Casey. Um, I unfortunately am not as familiar on the FTC side, so I may have to get back to you on that question. I can the, talk to the show, I can maybe. talk about that real quick. Oh, go for it, Lon, um, so on the the original version of, on the QX, we did an auto range when you were doing interrupted surveys that would auto range down from the 250 to the five volt in the field data computer, the field data collector application now we don't do the auto range um, so that you shouldn't see that anymore once you're using uh, FDC on the you know on the Mesa or the uh, Allegro AX or iOS. Thanks Lon. Did, did I answer your question Casey? Awesome. No thanks Lon. I greatly appreciate you hopping in there. And then feel free to throw your questions in the chat while we're going through the presentation. I'd like to take them ad hoc, but I know we're pressed for time real quick. We'll have more dedicated time to talk to questions at the end of the presentation for sure. So we've talked through a whole lot of terms. So that was a lot of info at once, um, but we talked about a lot of measurement terms and how they all really work together to help build what your device is capturing and then displaying all that information for you. So now we're going to get into some best practices for actually using your measurement tool. And so what we're first going to talk about real quick is calibration. So again, 
as I kind of highlighted earlier when we were talking about accuracy, making sure you have a, your device is calibrated regularly is the probably one of the most important pieces of maintenance you can do while uh, maintaining a, a measurement device, in this case, a DVM. Um, I know we at AI recommend getting your DVM calibrated at least once a year, but really what matters is that you can validate that the device is within calibration. So as you can see on the screen, before I went and like took my DVM to get calibrated, I had my same bow tie chart from earlier, my measurements across the entire range. I was only in within accuracy spec bounds for a certain section of my um, of my measurement range. I had a huge margin of error. So if I had done a whole line of surveys with this device and I went under an audit, there's a pretty good chance that they would that FIMSA or whoever would ask for that audit report would a would ask you. Do you have validation of that DVM being calibrated? That's not going to look very good for me if I didn't actually get this device validated and calibrated beforehand and I went to that survey. So then I'll go back in, I learned my lesson, I get my device calibrated, and then now that green line is what it looks like after calibration. You see that the margin of error is very small and we're just basically right along in that traceable standard. So, and also um, just a quick call out too, we can do calibrations for your DVM at AI World. So if you do come by, make sure to drop them off and we'll get you squared away. Kind of the next thing that's really important when you're taking measurements is knowing what you're going out there to capture. Um, so having an idea of what your, your structure is supposed to read like. So if you have PCS, making sure you use that database of record to ensure, oh, before I go and take my survey, this structure has been reading like within 50 volts of 800, negative 800 for however long or negative 900 for however long so that you know ahead of time, oh, I know kind of what I'm expecting to see when I go out in the field. Because then, as an example, I have two field computers up here. So you walk up to, um, if you're going to walk up to your rectifier and you're going to take a shunt reading, and if you see on your device, you hook up your leads, you take a measurement, you see 237 volts, you might think like, oh, that's definitely not what I'm supposed to be seeing on a shunt. So instead, you may take, you may make sure, okay, there's something wrong with my asset. Or if you didn't know that you were supposed to be looking for something like 25 millivolts on that shunt, you might take the reading and move on. So it's really important as a tech and as a person going and taking these measurements that you have a understanding of what your legacy um, structure looks like, what your readings are supposed to be, and at least know a general uh, idea of what to look for going forward. Then um, last thing I've got here is uh, maintaining your equipment. Um, so something as simple as just making sure that if you're going out and you're doing CI or DCVG surveys, um, clean your reference cell. Um, something really simple as that can really save you a lot of headache down the line, making sure um, double go through that checklist whenever you take before you go out in the field. When was the last time I cleaned my reference cell? Did I have charged it recently? Is it contaminated? Do I need to calibrate it? And so then that'll just save you a whole lot of time and make sure that whatever your readings you're capturing are the most accurate readings that you can capture. Then another one that comes up pretty often, I hear about it a lot on the support side too, is just making sure that your cables are connected right. Um, like I have an example there, our DVM 23, uh, 2130. It's just something as simple as, did I plug my leads in correctly? Are they hooked up on my structure right? Is there any in, any interference I might be able to see based on my connections? And just general maintenance in these items can really help make sure that whenever you go out in the field, the readings you're capturing are working for you and making sure that your assets are in compliance and that you know what to look for in the field. All right, that's all the content I had for today. Man, technical difficulty and we still finished with some time, right? So um, if anyone has any questions, I'll go ahead and open the floor um, to people that have any questions. And if you prefer, you can also drop your question on the chat and we'll be able to read it as well. Or you can unmute yourself since we have a couple minutes left at the end yeah um this is um tolson um with um, chevron mcbu uh, my question um is around um the, uh, the dvm meters after you've left them running for a while 
and um, you toggle to um, see the waveform. Sometimes the waveform is always out of whack. And what I found you know, helpful is to shut down the system and reload it. So is there any fix for that? Um, that's a good question. Um, I may have to pass that info along to our FTC product manager, um, but I'm happy to talk to you after the meeting as well and get some more info on what you're encountering. Um, but unfortunately at this time, I probably wouldn't have an answer for you on that one. Yeah, can you can you put uh, yeah. like what version you're running just so we know um, once we talk to the product manager about that, uh, if there were any issues at that time? Okay, I'll pull it up, sir. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, Eric, I see your question there. Is there a big change in adjustment between um, setup and uh, on setup and off delay between the QX and the DVM 2130? Um, I may pass that one over to Lon if you have any insight on that one, Lon. Is there any big change? No. Um, as far as the QX and the DVM 2130, the DVMs are very similar. Um, in the 2130, what was added was the battery and GPS. So internally, as far as their measurements, they're all the same. They're both uh, 100 mega ohm uh, input impedance. Um, for the QX, the AX, and the and the DVM twenty one thirty. So all the settings should be exactly the same. Awesome, thank you, Lon. And I think we missed one other question. Uh, if you have past PCS data for a location, does the surveying, surveying program on the Mesa automatically flag a point during a survey that has significant change from the last reading? Not currently. Um, mm -hmm. You're looking at a, a you know, something that has, you, you want to set a value from what I'm understanding of, say, this has changed by 50 or 100 millivolts since the last read, not currently. Um, but that is something that uh, you could put into the ideas portal and uh, definitely something we could look at for sure. Mm -hmm. Actually, not a bad idea. Yeah, that is a pretty good idea. I'm glad I thought of it. <laughs> and I'll drop a quick link to the ideas portal as well. If you have any other suggestions. So I do see Joel also, Joel Fellers also asked any recommended leads for your DVMs. Um, I know that the, uh, do you want to go ahead and talk to this one, Lon? Uh, you can use your fluke leads, um, mm -hmm. the same ones, uh, even if they're the safety shielded leads. Uh, if you just, there's a grommet on the um, on the DVM. If you pull that off, you can use those fluke style leads on there as well. Right, because our DVM we are, does we're have- We're currently uh, looking at a lead set to provide uh, as well. So we're, uh, um, we're looking into uh, leads as well. Awesome. Thank you, Lon. Nice Hi, see William. Good question. to see you. Oh, you already saw that one. Okay. Yeah, um, that's a good question. In fact, I know we're kind of running out of time here, but I see you've got, yeah, AC and DC interference, um, setting up an ideal setup of equipment to reach good and reliable measurements and readings. Um, yeah, so I know that we're kind of low on time, but we might have to take that one off of the off of the webinar, but I know that I would love to talk to you about this directly. Mm -hmm. I, about... I will add that the, yeah. the filtering on the DVM 2130 for AC is extremely good. So it's, yes. they, they put a lot of really good filtering in there. So if you have some AC on there, it shouldn't affect your DC readings. Sounds good. If you have any other questions, um, feel free to reply to our emails. We'll send a follow-up as well. So if you have any additional questions, you can always reach us or reach um, marketing staff at aiworldwide.com as well. 
Um, and we'll make sure these get to Cole and our team. And we'll see you for the next one. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you all so much. And be much. on the lookout for the recorded uh, version of the video soon so you can watch it on demand. Thank you all. Have a good day.